Hello, it's Gary again, and welcome back to Gundog. It's time for episode four, and if you've stuck with us this far, hopefully you've been enjoying it, but I think you'll really start to enjoy it now. I think this is the point, uh, hopefully, where the, where the story really starts to kick into high gear. Last week's episode was a bit of a shocker. As I'm sure you know, Dakota um, was forced to leave her friend and companion Falk uh, behind after he was uh, mortally wounded by a self-destructing uh, damaged mech drone blew his leg clean off, not looking too good for Falk. She was forced to leave him for dead as um, mech units were closing in around him and she ended up uh, uh, running for the hills. That's where we left the episode. So we're going to pick up there very, uh, very soon in just a moment. Just one quick, uh, a couple of quick brief notes. If you're waiting for the podcast version, it's very, very close now. We're, we're crossing the T's and dotting the I's. We'll have a podcast version of Gun Dog uh, dropping into your podcast feeds very, very soon. I'll have an update for you on that. Uh, very shortly. And uh, while you're here on the YouTube channel, please do check out the uh, making of video that I just dropped um, in the YouTube channel as well. Really cool behind the scenes kind of mini uh, documentary that uh, Razor uh, made uh, uh, talking to me and Austin and, and Shannon all about how we made Gundog. It's really, really cool. Um, but for right now, let's get into it. Let's get into episode four of Gundog, This Little Light of Mine. Gundog by Gary Witta. Chapter Thirteen. This was all your fault. All of it. You should have never let him go through that door. Never let him anywhere near that thing. You knew it was dangerous, and you didn't stop him. How many times did he save your life, and when it's his turn to rely on you, you're useless. Useless. How could you fuck up this badly? This close to the end? This is all because of you. Only because of you. All of it. Your fault. You let him down, left him helpless in the hands of the mech. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Again and again, these words and others like them played in Dakota's head as she trekked through the rugged mountain terrain. That incessant inner monologue, steeped in blame and guilt, drove her forward beyond every physical limit she thought she had. For the next two days, she pushed herself, barely eating stopping to rest only when forced by a combination of daylight and open terrain, and even then, unwilling to sleep, too driven to move onward at the first opportunity. But on the third day, something in her brain finally told her that she had to stop, or she'd drop from exhaustion, and then she'd have only let Falk down again, too stupid to know her own limitations. Dead, mere miles from her journey's end, and the promise awaiting her there. When she came upon a stream, she drank and cleaned herself up, careful not to wash away the ink on her arm that sweat had already eroded. Then she slept the rest of the day behind a waterfall, where she had nightmares about Falk and the fate she'd consigned him to. She woke to find the moon high in the sky and cursed herself for wasting precious dark. Fresh from rest, she went at it harder than ever. She continued over the ridge, and by moonlight, navigated her way down a precariously steep slope. The only way onward that she could find. Every other route was impassable. She had to check the ground beneath her feet with every step, knowing that one loose stone could lead to a broken ankle, and that would put an end to everything. By the time she arrived at the bottom, the sky was lightening, and she found herself at the side of a road surrounded by dense forest though it took her a moment to be sure that it really was a road. It was so covered with overgrowth and debris. It was the burned-out shell of a car that gave it away. She knew from the map that a road would lead her to her final goal, but she couldn't be sure that this was it, or if it was, which way to go. If the map was that specific, it was beyond her ability to understand. She took a chance and picked a direction feeling reasonably confident that a road fallen into such disuse would no longer be patrolled by Mech. 
After about two miles, the road took her across a stone bridge, and then to what seemed like a very incongruous thing to be found here, deep in the forest. A man-made complex, with multiple buildings of stark, angular gray concrete. The structures were mossy and decrepit, largely reclaimed by nature. One of them was tilting and looked close to collapse, and they reminded Dakota of tombstones, like the ones she'd seen in graveyards during her travels with Sam. That still seemed a strange thing to her, the old custom of burying people in the ground. Every dead person she'd ever known had either been left to rot where they fell, or was recycled by the mech. She clambered over piles of concrete and rebar, and made her way to the largest building in the complex, which also looked the most structurally sound. The sign she passed as she entered its cavernous hall read, Visitor Center. But there was nothing here worth visiting. Just the remnants of smashed and overturned glass cases and pedestals. What Dakota figured to be exhibits of some kind. Part of the room was burned black by some long-ago fire. She pulled a placard from the debris at her feet and tried to read it, but it was too badly charred. The only word she could make out was, Washington which she knew was the name of one of the old territories far to the east of here. One of the very first to fall to the mech. In the next room was a big dining area, or what used to be one. It was covered now in a thick layer of dust and rubble from the collapsed ceiling, which let in shafts of daylight. The room was lined with tall windows all along one side, though those had all shattered, and the branches of trees now jutted through. She came upon a table that, amazingly, still had a tablecloth in place settings, all smothered in a thick patina of dust. She found an intact chair and dragged it over to the table, then sat there for a while, at a place setting, just to see what it felt like to do what people used to do. She almost fell asleep there, but jerked herself awake when she felt a cool breeze on her neck. The breeze was coming in through the broken windows, and as she looked in that direction... She realized that the window side of the room had been designed to offer a vista of the mountains looming above. The overgrown trees now obscured much of that view, but what little she glimpsed of it. She felt a jolt of adrenaline and leaped to her feet. It can't be. Picking her way through the rubble, she clambered through one of the windows, careful not to cut herself on the shards of glass that still bordered it, and pushed through the trees and ferns up a shallow incline, striving for an unbroken view— she burst through, and there it was. Directly ahead of her, carved into a great mountain, were four giant faces, each at least twenty meters tall. They were the faces of old men, older than almost anyone Dakota had ever met. She couldn't even begin to comprehend why the faces were there, or for that matter, how. But she had no doubt about where she was. This was the place she'd been searching for. Dakota was here. She had followed Fox's map to its conclusion. But it gave no more specificity than this. No further instruction. Where was she supposed to go now? What was she supposed to do? She kept going, walking closer to the four faces. Because it was all she could think of to do. They loomed over her silently judging her with their grim, humorless expressions. She reached a fallen chain-link fence topped with razor wire, probably encircling this entire mountain to keep people out. But now it was laid down flat, and she could just walk across it. A rusted sign was affixed to a portion of the fence, half covered with fallen leaves. So she brushed them aside in order to read its big block letters. Warning. Restricted area. No trespassing beyond this point. Property United States Air Force. Air Force? Dakota's mind started racing. Mom was in the Air Force. She was running now, over the fallen fence and beyond. The four stone men still looking down at her with their dead-eyed stares. Whatever it is, it has to be here. It has to be right. Halt! Dakota froze. The voice sounded halfway mech. Oh, please, not now. Not when I'm so close. Something mechanical rose up within a cluster of ferns, 
a sensor on a telescopic pole. It looked around and found Dakota with its camera lens. A single, unblinking eye. Do not attempt to move, said the voice. Stand by. Dakota wasn't sure what this thing was. It didn't look mech. But it didn't look like any human technology she'd ever seen either. Strangely, it struck her as somehow a little of both. Either way, instinct told her not to argue with it. An emitter beneath the camera flicked on and bathed her with a red light that swept her from head to toe. Dakota understood that she was being scanned. Retinal positive for Bregman, Dakota, J. The ground lurched beneath Dakota's feet. She threw out her arms, barely keeping her balance, and saw that a perfect square of forest floor, about three meters across, was sinking into the ground, with her standing on top of it. She was on an elevator that was descending into the unknown depths below. She had to decide in an instant, stay on this thing or jump off while there's still time. And she made the decision to stay. Whatever this was, wherever it was taking her, this was what she had come so far, and at such great cost, to do. The world above reduced to a shrinking square of daylight, and Dakota steeled herself, ready to meet her fate, to learn what secrets this mountain held in its dark embrace. By the time the platform stopped its descent, the square of daylight above had disappeared completely. Dakota couldn't be sure how far she'd traveled. Her journey down was measured only by featureless rock walls and the occasional inset light, but she guessed it was around 200 meters. She stood now at the end of a smooth, curved corridor, large enough for a truck to pass through. Ceiling lights clicked on in a cascade sequence, disappearing around the bend. There was only one way for Dakota to go. She stepped off the platform and started down the corridor, her footsteps echoing on the concrete. She'd never seen an environment like this. Everything so perfectly smooth and shiny, spotlessly clean. All she'd ever known was destruction and decay, the aged and crumbling ruins of a forgotten world. Even the township was all wood and wire and poured concrete, decidedly low-tech. The mech cities were advanced, of course, and their towering architecture glimmered even from a distance, but she had never ventured close enough to really see them. The long tunnel ended at an armored door. She looked for a control panel or something to stand by. An emitter above the door scanned her. After what felt like too long a wait, she heard a mechanical whirring and the hiss of hydraulics, and the door slid open before her. She stepped through. Lights began to flicker on, casting her surroundings in stark fluorescence. Dakota didn't like the lights. They were too bright and reminded her of the township by night. But she forgot all about them once she saw the marvels that they illuminated. She was in a space so vast that it disappeared into the darkness at the far end where lights hadn't yet been turned on. The whole place filled with mechanical equipment, computer terminals, hydraulic lifts, workbenches, every manner of industrial tool, machine, and engine part. Big lockers with cage mesh doors revealing more treasures inside. For a mechanic like Dakota, it was a dream, even though she couldn't identify what most of the stuff was. And once again, she was struck by just how clean and preserved everything was. Somehow there was no dust here. It was all like new. She wiped her finger on a workbench just to be sure, and her finger came back cleaner than before. She'd smeared grime along the bench's spotless surface. Initializing heuristic interface, stand by. The voice came from all around her. The same not-quite-mech-like voice that had spoken to her before. And just ahead of her, a haze of bright light formed, generated by a pair of emitters on opposite sides. As Dakota stepped forward to get a better look, the haze began to resolve into a shape. A pair of eyes formed, then a nose, and a mouth. And in seconds, Dakota found herself standing before a three-dimensional hologram of a human face. 
The way it was put together from millions of tiny graphical artifacts to form a coherent image was wondrous and strange. It looked like a computer's approximation of a human face more than the real thing. And yet, something about it felt familiar. The holographic face's eyes opened, looked at her. Its features softened in a look of recognition. And then it spoke. Oh my. It wasn't the same voice as before. This one was female, like the face itself. And though it was oddly modulated, as if passing through layers of post-processing, it was unmistakably more human than the one that was always telling her to stand by. Dakota? The face said. Is it really you? No. It didn't sound like a computer. This was not the unnatural way the mech mimicked human speech. This was not that at all. This voice sounded truly alive, as though in possession of a human soul. How do you know who I am? Dakota asked. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'd expect you to recognize me, said the face. You were barely two years old when you last saw me but I would know your face anywhere, at any age. You still have your father's eyes. My father? said Dakota. You knew my father? Who are you? The face gave her a smile filled with loving warmth that no computer could emulate. My name is Rosie, the voice said. I'm your mother. Chapter 14 Dakota backed away from the holographic face. It had to be a trick. Had to be. Somehow the mech had done this. Yes, it all made sense now. That was how she and Falk had managed so improbably to escape. To make it this far without recapture. The mech had let them do it. Had watched them the whole way. Followed Dakota here. But to what end? This isn't real, she said. You're not real. I understand this isn't easy, said Rosie. Trust me, it isn't easy for me either. And I've been preparing for this day for twenty years. But you need to calm down and take a breath. I'm detecting elevated levels of adrenaline and increased heart rate. You're not real, Dakota said again. My mother is dead. That's true in one sense, not in another, said Rosie. My body died twenty years ago at Bismarck, but before I left for that battle, my brain was scanned, and a complete virtual copy was stored in the computer servers here in this facility. My personality, memories, consciousness, it's all really me. Dakota, I am your mom. Dakota looked again at the face hovering before her, and now she began to see it. It was the eyes. They were the same as those of the woman in the photograph she'd stared at for so many hours. Kind, but somehow sad. Still, Dakota fought the urge to believe any of this. What you're talking about, it isn't possible, she said. Copying brains onto computers? I'm not stupid, you know. It wasn't possible before the mech came, said Rosie, but we learned a lot from them. From the technology we were able to steal or salvage from our encounters with them. Dakota. There's so much more that I'd like to show you. That's why you're here. Dakota felt numb. Paralyzed. More than anything, she wanted to believe that she was talking to her mother. Her actual mother. As impossible as that sounded but she needed more. What's my middle name? She asked. Jefferson. Your dad and I got that from one of the guys you saw outside on the mountain. What's my brother's name? Sam. Rosie smiled. That was just a name we liked. What was your rank in the Air Force? Lieutenant Colonel. Dakota's mind raced. 
She wasn't being smart enough. Those were things the mech already knew, or could have easily found out. She needed something that only she and her mother would know. Something the mech couldn't possibly have ever learned. Sing me the lullaby you sang for Sam when he was a baby, she said. It was the same lullaby Sam had sung her when she was little, during so many sleepless nights hiding from the mech. Well, it's been a while, said Rosie. And I'm not sure this voice synthesizer can really match my actual pipes, but here it goes. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Dakota only just managed to fall into a chair. Her legs would no longer hold her. As her eyes welled with tears, and she looked once again at the hologram for the first time, she truly believed. Mom. The word was a whisper. Oh, baby, said Rosie, her synthesized voice betraying her emotion. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I wasn't there for you when you needed me. I'm sorry I can't hold you right now. But I'm here. It's really me. And I'm so proud of you. I've been sleeping. Dreaming. For twenty years. That one day. You'd find your way here. And I have so much to tell you. But first. I need to ask you something. Dakota knew what the question was. You want to know about Sam? Yes. He's okay, said Dakota. He's alive. Rosie smiled. Tell me everything. In the hours that followed, Dakota told Rosie all about her life, and Sam's. She talked about the years running and hiding from the mech, and how Sam had cared for her and kept her safe. She talked about their capture, and about their life together in the township. She explained what had happened to Sam's arm, and how he'd slowly changed, the suffocating confinement and ever-present observation draining his will to fight, and even at times to live. But she also assured her mother that he was still the same Sam she had known when he was six years old the last time she'd seen him. Loving, kind, selfless, brave when it mattered. One thing I don't understand, said Rosie, when Dakota was done. If Sam didn't come with you, how did you find this place? He had the map. He doesn't have it anymore. It was on the same arm he lost in the accident. But even if he did... I don't think he would have come. He lied to me for years about what the map was, trying to protect me. He didn't want us risking our lives trying to find this place. I think, though, that if he'd known you'd be here waiting for us, he might have found the strength. In fact, I know he would have. Rosie's face showed a mix of emotions. Regret. Pride. Love. It was amazing how accurately this holographic simulacrum of a human face could so accurately convey human feelings. So how did you get here? Rosie asked. There was a guy, Falk, who came to the township. He had the exact same tattoo on his arm. He said that his father was a gundog pilot, like you. We broke out together. Eugene Fox, kid said Rosie. Jean was in my squadron, and we gave Stephen and Sam the same map. Some other pilots who had kids did the same, when the end was looking close. The hope was that maybe one or two of you would find your way back here, when you were old enough. 
I'm so glad, Dakota, that you were one of them. Where's Stephen now? Stephen, thought Dakota. Falk had never told her his first name. He didn't make it, she said. The mech got him. A few days from here. We were so close. That agonizing memory now came back to her in full force, twisting her stomach into a sickening knot. For all her travails, she'd never experienced real grief before. Not like this. And she hated it. His absence had carved a hole, leaving her feeling hollow and alone, and guilty for not having done more to save him. She wanted to wish all those emotions away, but she knew from others who'd spoken about losing loved ones that these feelings would be with her for a long time. Maybe for the rest of her life. And some part of her was even okay with that. It was better than forgetting him. I'm sorry, said Rosie. He was a good kid. And not only that, but for this to work, we need two of you. I'll have to think on that problem. Honestly, I had always hoped it would be you and Sam. She paused, and her mood seemed to darken. Perhaps it's best he lost the arm, she said. That was a strange thing for a mother to say about her son. Why? Dakota asked. The mech will interrogate Sam about you. Try to find out what he knew about where you were headed. If he still had the map, they'd be able to figure it out for themselves almost immediately. It may take a little longer for them to extract that information from him now. What do you mean, extract? Dakota said. Sam couldn't possibly reconstruct that map from memory, even if he wanted to. He lost it years ago. The mech have ways around that, Rosie answered. They have technology that can scan our brains, recover information we can't consciously remember. It takes time. But it works. They did it to some of us they captured during the war. It's not unlike the cortex mapping tech we stole from them and used to preserve my consciousness here. We have to assume we don't have long before the mech finds this facility. I had prepared a three-month orientation and training program for you but we're going to have to compress that. Orientation and training? Dakota said. For what? I think we can afford to wait until morning before we get into all that, said Rosie. You look tired. When was the last time you slept the whole night in a comfortable bed? Dakota honestly didn't know if she ever had. The hard, slatted frames and thin, itchy mattresses of the township bunks certainly didn't qualify. It's been a while, she said. Come with me, said Rosie. The rosy hologram was apparently capable of manifesting anywhere in the underground complex, as long as there were emitters there. And there were emitters everywhere. By beaming herself from location to location, she showed Dakota to a kind of dorm room with bunks and lockers. Some of the bunks looked like they'd been slept in and were never made back up again. Others you could bounce a quarter off of. There were still a few clothes and other personal effects in some of the lockers and on nightstands, and some were even strewn across the floor. It looked as if this place had been abandoned in a hurry. Maid's day off, explained Rosie. Dakota just looked at her, having no idea what a maid was. Just pick any bunk, said Rosie. Get some rest. Sleep as late as you want. Tomorrow you will eat a real breakfast. And after that, we'll begin. Dakota took off her boots and coveralls and slid into one of the unused bunks. The sheets were cool, clean, and unbelievably soft. They caressed her like nothing she'd ever felt. It was bliss. She stared up at the ceiling, as was her habit. The stark fluorescent lights of her head were still buzzing. How do I turn off the lights? She asked. 
Just ask me, said Rosie. And the lights flicked off, leaving the room lit only by the shimmer of her hologram. I can control everything in this facility, so if there's anything you want, just ask. Thanks. Mom, said Dakota. That was going to take some getting used to. You're welcome, sweetie. Good night. Rosie was just shimmering out of sight when Dakota called her back. Mom? What is it? One more time? Rosie smiled. And then she began. This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Chapter 15 Dakota slept longer than she ever had that night, though she was again visited by nightmares about Falk, each one more vivid and upsetting than the one before. At first, her mind simply replayed the moment when Falk approached the damaged rover, except in agonizing slow motion, so as to allow Dakota's subconscious time to berate her for her failure to intervene, to stop him, to do something. In later versions, Sam was there too, or her mother, fully alive again, all of them paying the price for Dakota's inaction. And in one nightmare, she was no longer Dakota at all, but Falk, bleeding out under the tree in the light of the burning house, feeling his pain, his fear, as his end drew near. Dakota was no stranger to bad dreams, and had taught herself to will herself awake to escape from them. But there was no escaping this last one. Like Falk, she was paralyzed. Trapped. In the end, it was only the pulsing of an alarm that roused her and made her sit up groggily. It took Dakota a moment to remember where she was, where her long journey had brought her. As she looked around at the underground dormitory, reality slowly came back to her through a haze of sleep and the phantom pain from the nightmare. The four faces the scanner, the elevator ride, the underground workshop. All of that was real. The only thing that still seemed like a dream, too much a product of her deep subliminal desires, was the frankly ridiculous idea that her long-dead mother had somehow been resurrected as a computer-generated hologram. Perhaps her exhausted mind had conjured up this mother as some kind of coping mechanism. Or perhaps... Dakota, said Rosie. Dakota rubbed her eyes, trying to rid herself of the last residue of sleep and dream. When she opened them, her mother's face was there, shimmering in the holographic ether, looking at her expectantly. Bregman, on your feet. Now the mother hologram was barking at her like a military commander. And it worked. Dakota scrambled out of bed. What is it? What's that alarm? Something topside tripped a perimeter sensor, said Rosie. If Dakota wasn't fully awake before, she was now. A chill ran through her. Mech? No, said Rosie. The base sensors are calibrated to detect them at long range, and would have spotted them way farther out. It's either an animal sniffing around, or it's human. Let's go look. Rosie led Dakota back to the cavernous room where they had first met. When Dakota first arrived, all of the computer terminals were dark. But now, several were functioning and projecting panels of holographic data. And they weren't the only machines now active. There was some kind of beverage maker dripping hot brown liquid into a glass jug. Rosie said it was coffee, which Dakota had heard of but had never tried. Rosie urged her to drink some, told her it would help wake her up. She said the beans... Apparently coffee was made from beans, had been freeze-dried while this facility was in standby mode and should taste as fresh as when they were first ground decades ago. 
None of that meant anything to Dakota. But she tried a sip of the stuff, only to find it revolting, bitter, and what she imagined drinking dirt might be like. She wound up drinking two cups of it anyway. As foul as it was, it was still better than the mech's stim drink, and just as effective. Like getting a jolt from an observer, except you could still feel your tongue in the tips of your fingers afterward. Panel three, said Rosie, and brought that screen to the forefront of a multi-panel holographic display. It was a live feed from a camera on the surface, just inside the down chain-link fence that Dakota had walked across the day before. Something was definitely moving through the brush, but hidden. It could be a deer, or a wolf, or a human in a crouch, trying to stay low. Going to thermal, said Rosie, and the display changed to a bright spectrum of blue-green tones, with a bloom of orange-red heat at its center. The shape of that bloom left no room for doubt. It was human, hunched over to stay out of sight as it pushed its way through bushes and ferns. Hmm. Rare to see a human moving around in the open, said Rosie. The mech have just about rounded everyone up. A human hasn't tripped a sensor here in more than three years. Now two in two days? She looked at Dakota. Was it just you and Stephen? Was there anyone else with you? It was just the two of us, Dakota said. But she agreed with her mother's implication that there had to be more than coincidence at work here. For a moment... She allowed herself to get carried away, and imagine it might somehow be Falk. But the heat shape on the thermal display was moving on two legs. A reality that even her momentary optimism couldn't banish. The brush is thinning out, said Rosie. If they move any closer, they'll have to show themselves. Switching feeds? The thermal display blinked out, replaced by the regular camera view of the surface. Again, showing nothing but bushes. A long moment passed, and then the bushes moved, and a person stepped out. A person Dakota knew. She felt her eyes widen. It couldn't be. He couldn't be here. But he was. It was Runyon. Command Unit Report Unit Rank War Commander First Class Designation Mech 39487651-28743 Filed 11798331 MKST 7623.842 this unit continues to supervise standard interrogation of all prisoners at Labor Township, number 7424, Sector 11. To determine whereabouts of escape subjects number 81-47676, Bregman, and number 39-90983, Falk. Interrogation so far unproductive, neurogenic imager indicates all prisoners answering truthfully. This unit conducted interrogation of prisoner number 8147675, Samuel Bregman, older sibling of number 8147676, Bregman. Prisoner denies any knowledge of Bregman's escape plan's intent, destination, or whereabouts. Neurogenic imager indicates prisoner answering untruthfully or withholding information. This unit will proceed with enhanced interrogation. Identity of additional escape subject confirmed as number 81-54729, William Runyon. Circumstances under review, additional search units dispatched. This unit collating information from field report of units dispatched to scene of possible human activity at Grid Ref E57SB-35847 on 11784827 MKST 98297 Evidence found of rover unit damaged by human small arms fire 
Blood detected at scene matches DNA profile of subject number 39-90983, Falk. No body found at scene or in wider sector. Search additional units dispatched to conduct more thorough search of surrounding area. Whereabouts of escape subject number 39-90983, Falk, remains unknown. Stand by. Chapter 16 You know him? Rosie asked. Yes, said Dakota. I mean, not really. Another worker from my township. Rosie continued to watch Runyon on the surface monitor. How the hell did he get here? Dakota was already searching for an answer to that very question. How could he possibly have escaped from the township when it would surely be under lockdown following her breakout with Falk? unless the mech had let him escape, or merely transported him out. They would have interrogated everyone at the township by now, and if he knew something about her destination, they might have forced him to help them find her. But what could he possibly know? She had told him nothing, hadn't spoken to him, in fact, had barely seen him since she'd fallen in with Falk to plot their escape. Maybe Falk or Sam had told him something? No. Neither was that careless. How the fuck is he here? Can he get inside here, the way I did? Dakota asked. The facility is programmed to admit only those people with specific retinal profiles stored in its system, Rosie replied. But I can override that. Do you trust him? Did she? The truth was, she barely knew Runyon. It had taken her a moment to even recall his name. She thought back to that one occasion, actually quite recent, though it felt like a lifetime ago, when he stood up for her at story time and earned himself a black eye for his trouble. His defense of her had seemed genuine. But there were other times when she'd felt eyes on her and turned to catch him staring before he could quickly look away. Had he been spying on her? A mech agent? It was certainly a possibility. After all, he did have one of the better jobs in the township an electrical maintenance detail that spared him the hard labor and frequent accidents that came with factory or foundry work. He might well have gotten that assignment in return for keeping tabs on Dakota and anyone else the mech had suspicions about. And in the end, she decided, it didn't matter. The more she thought on it, the more it seemed impossible that Runyon could have known anything about her escape plan. He couldn't have told the mech where she was going, or led them here because he didn't know where she was going in the first place. She stepped closer to the display and studied his face. Like her, he seemed lost, unsure where to go next. But he didn't seem afraid, as he surely would be if he was here under mech coercion. She sighed. None of this made any damn sense. There was nothing Dakota hated more than an unsolved puzzle and there was only one way to solve this one. Let him in, she said. Dakota waited at the bottom of the elevator as the hydraulic system brought Runyon down. When the platform arrived, and Runyon saw Dakota standing before him, he blinked several times, as though to test whether she was a hallucination or actually real. Dakota? he said. His voice was hoarse. Runyon, how are you here? she asked. He seemed not to hear her, or at least understand her, and stepped forward unsteadily. He looked terrible. His eyes were distant, unfocused. His township coveralls were torn and bloody, and his arms and legs were covered with cuts and abrasions. One arm was held in a sling fashioned from one of his sleeves, and he was emaciated, too to the point that Dakota feared he would break at the slightest touch. He had always been a skinny boy, all knees and elbows, gangly. Now he was a walking skeleton. That he had gotten here was a puzzle enough. That he had managed it in this condition was nothing short of a miracle. Before Dakota could repeat her question, 
he staggered forward and fell into her, wrapping his arms around her. She had to grab him to prevent him from collapsing to the floor, and as she did, she was so struck by how light he was, how little was left of him. There was no way he was working for the mech, leading them here. Their algorithms would never have allowed them to let a valuable asset slip to within a hair's breadth of death, as he so clearly was. Rosie materialized before them. He's severely dehydrated. Borderline malnutrition, too. We need to get him to a bed and get some fluids in him. And then I'll do a more thorough scan. Dakota lifted him easily onto one shoulder. He didn't resist. It seemed he'd already passed out. She carried him to the dorm, where she laid him on an empty bunk. Rosie showed her where to find the medical equipment, and told her how to set up an IV. And then, all they could do was wait. And watch. Runyon slept the whole rest of the day, and well through the night, during which time he went through three bags of the IV solution. By the time he finally sat up late the next morning, he looked far better though his eyes still had that distant look. It wasn't a dream, he said, when he saw Dakota sitting on her bunk beside him. Rosie had decided to remain unseen and unheard for now, until they knew more. How did you get here? Dakota asked. I followed you, he said, still swaying a little from his long sleep. I mean, I followed your map. Bullshit. There was only one map, and we took it with us. There used to be two, he said. The one on your brother's arm. I used to see it all the time when I'd come to fix something in the factory before he lost it. I never asked him about it because I knew he wouldn't say, but... I could tell it was some kind of map. And you made a copy? Dakota asked. Kinda, said Runyon, tapping his temple kept it all up here. This only made Dakota more skeptical. How could he have just remembered it and decoded it? For that matter, how did he even realize it was a map? To her, it had always looked like an arcane and indecipherable mosaic of dots and lines and pictograms. Even when Falk first told her what it was, she had a hard time believing it. Yet this little runt wanted her to believe he'd figured it out all by himself just from a few glances at her brother's arm, and then memorized the whole thing? Bullshit. I know what you're thinking, said Runyon. But I'm good with things like that. Puzzles and riddles and stuff. It's why the mech put me in engineering. I really wanted to solve it, so I'd get a look at it whenever I could, and over time I just kind of figured it out. And when you left, he shrugged, I kind of figured that's where you were going. I'm glad I was right. I don't know how much longer I would have lasted out there by myself. Are you buying any of this? said Dakota. She wasn't addressing Runyon. Rosie responded, but didn't appear. Actually, I am. Eidetic memory. And I'm guessing a genius-level IQ, too. Dakota, we might have just gotten very lucky here. Who was that? Runyon asked, looking around for the source of the voice, which seemed to be coming from everywhere all at once. What do you mean lucky? Dakota asked. Let's get some proper food in him, Rosie replied. In both of you. You'll think better on a full stomach. Runyon's eyes widened. You have food? Dakota led Runyon to the empty mess hall, which Rosie had introduced her to the day before. The only food was 30-year-old military rations in vacuum-sealed plastic packets and cans with ring pull tops, but it had tasted better than anything she'd eaten in her life. Runyon clearly had the same reaction. He wolfed down chicken and baked beans in a brownie square, a meal he selected on Dakota's recommendation while Dakota tried something different today. Beef curry with rice and fruit pudding. Rosie also brewed more coffee, but had to cut Runyon off after the second cup. Dakota could guess why, now that he was mostly restored to strength. He was jumpy enough already. 
After they ate, Dakota took a look at Runyon's arm and was relieved to see that it wasn't broken, just a bad sprain he'd suffered in a fall. It would mend itself quickly enough. Only then did Rosie reveal herself to him. The sight of her holographic form unsettled him at first, but Dakota assured him there was nothing to be afraid of, and he quickly accepted that. What was more surprising to Dakota was how fast she herself had come to accept this reality. Just days ago, the idea of a digital reincarnation of her mother would have seemed beyond imagination, and yet, here she was reassuring Runyon that it was no big deal. Rosie introduced herself as Lieutenant Colonel Rosalind Bregman, United States Air Force. I'm in command of this facility, she said, and you're my guest here, for now, on the word of my daughter. But if you want to remain here, I need to trust you. And that means you'll need to tell me everything. I want you to start by proving to me that you really did memorize that map, that you weren't brought here with outside assistance. Do you have something I could draw with? Runyon asked. Rosie conjured a holographic display in the air before him, a glowing blank slate. You can draw on that with your finger, she said. And he did. In fact, he redrew the entire map in less than three minutes. Every dot, line, pictogram, and detail recreated perfectly. And when he was done, Rosie recalled an image of the original map from her database and overlaid it. The two were a perfect match. It seemed to Dakota that a memory like that was impossible. But then she remembered how vividly she was able to call to mind the photo of her parents. If she had any talent as an artist, she'd be able to reproduce that perfectly, too. I understand how you remembered the map, said Rosie, but not how you were able to read it. Runyon shrugged. Like I said, I I've always been good at puzzles. It took some figuring out, but eventually I realized it's actually two maps, overlaid, one with stars and constellations for wayfinding, the other with natural landmarks, but they're offset at a 90-degree angle so they don't match up. You have to read the stars with the map held horizontal and the landmarks with it held vertical. Dakota stared at him. Then you figured that out all by yourself? She said incredulously. Runyon shrugged. I didn't have much else to think about. I like him, said Rosie. That explains how you know where I went, said Dakota. But not how you got here. How did you even get out of the township? Runyon looked down at his feet. I spied on you. You can't have seen us escape, said Dakota. Everyone was in the barracks. No. No, not when you escaped, Runyon replied. When you and Falk were plotting. While you guys were talking at story time. I sat close and listened. I heard you talking about the window magnet, the blind spot and the perimeter sensors, the trick with the ice shower, lowering your body temperature like that to trick the drones' thermal sensors. That part was really cool. Bach was smart to figure that out. I guess he didn't make it, though. I'm sorry. I, I didn't really know him, but... I liked him. Dakota had to shove her feelings deep down. This still doesn't add up, she said. Falk never told me where the blind spot was, so even if you overheard us, you wouldn't know where to go. There's more than one blind spot, said Runyon. I've done maintenance on those sensor towers. If you look at the coverage area of each tower and how they're aligned in relation to one another, there's one two-meter blind spot for every 600 meters of fence. I knew about that already, and the window magnet was easy enough to make, but without the shower trick, it wouldn't have done me much good. And I, I never really had a good reason to leave before now. Dakota sat quietly for a moment, processing all of this. It seemed plausible enough, but one detail still nagged at her. You were there, listening to me and Falk that whole time, she said. I would have noticed you. I knew you wouldn't. Runyon looked down at the floor again. 
No, nobody notices me. Not really. Dakota had only one more question. Why? she asked. Why did you follow me? I don't know. I guess because you were the only thing that made life bearable for me there. Even from far away. He still hadn't lifted his gaze from the floor. You barely know me, said Dakota. I know. Weird, huh? All I know is... Once I knew you were going, I wanted to come with you, to be a part of whatever you were doing, and I knew if I asked you, you'd say no, but I had to come. Dakota was silent for a long time. The kid had escaped, had nearly died because of her. It was a lot to take in. I'm sorry, Runyon said at last. If you want me to leave, I'll leave. On the contrary, said Rosie. You're most welcome. In fact, you might be exactly what we need. With both Rosie and Dakota satisfied that Runyon's story held water, it was time for Rosie to tell hers. So Dakota and Runyon sat in the mess hall and listened. Before the last battle, at Bismarck, we knew we would almost certainly lose, she began. Our forces across the world had been totally destroyed, and what little was left had fallen back to the last city to hold it for as long as we could. Our forces consisted of only two divisions, pieced together from the remains of those the mech had already shattered. That, and the gun dogs that we built here, at this facility. We designed them using mech technology, reverse-engineered from units we'd captured. Figuring out their tech wasn't easy, but over time, we were able to integrate at least some aspects of it into our own, which allowed us to develop better armor and weapons, enough to put a real hurt on the forces that were coming for Bismarck. Still, we knew that this was most likely the end, and we were all prepared to die fighting. If we'd just had more time, we might actually have turned things around even banged up as we were. Because our scientists at this facility had finally cracked the mech technology database wide open, and from that, we learned everything we needed to know to build a new generation of weapons as good as anything they had. Maybe even better. And we were starting to get pretty close to making that a reality. But by then, Bismarck was the only human city still standing, and the mech had it under siege with a quarter of a million people trapped inside. Global Command, in their infinite wisdom, ordered every asset they had left. Every gundog, every operator, every support crew and engineer to Bismarck to try and hold it, including everyone from this base. And, well, you know the rest. After that, there simply wasn't anyone left to fight to operate the new weapons, even if we'd had time to build them. That doesn't explain how you're here, said Runyon. You died at Bismarck, didn't you? Well, in one sense, I did. In another, I didn't, said Rosie. Like I said, we knew Bismarck was probably the end. And we'd developed the ability using the tech we hacked out of the mech archive, to map a human brain and store it indefinitely in a computer core. As the senior officer, I volunteered to be the guinea pig. So, before everyone left for Bismarck, a copy of my consciousness was uploaded to the mainframe here. If the real me failed to return, I was to be activated, and I would act as a caretaker, to preserve the unfinished work that remained here, continue it as much as I could by myself, in the hopes that some day, someone might return to complete it. That's why we gave our kids those maps, so that if they survived, they'd be able to find their way back here, find what we'd left for them, for you. 
And what did you leave for us? Dakota asked. What's here? Rosie smiled. Let me show you. She led them through the hallways, rooms, heavily armored doors, and more hallways. This vast underground facility seemed to go on forever. But eventually, they arrived in another cavernous workspace, much like the first, though its full size was impossible to gauge because most of it was shrouded in darkness. I'm going to turn the lights on now, said Rosie. Are you ready? There was something new in her voice. A sense of giddy anticipation. Yes, said Dakota, although she honestly had no idea if she was or not. Dakota, I'm so sorry I wasn't there to see you grow up. To give you everything I wanted for you, Rosie said. But at least I can give you this. I hope you'll accept it. One by one, the lights clicked on until the entire space was illuminated, as was the towering, armored colossus it contained. Dakota and Runyon craned their necks and gazed upon the thing in silent awe. It was vaguely the shape of a man. Two powerful legs, what looked almost like arms. A narrow waist that gave way to a heavy, barrel-chested torso, and a head though in place of a face, it only had a featureless domed cockpit. From top to bottom, it was nearly twenty meters tall. Dakota had never in her life seen anything like it. And yet, she knew at a glance exactly what it was. She'd heard Sam describe them many times, when he lulled her to sleep by telling her favorite bedtime story about her mother's heroism at the Battle of Bismarck. That's a gun dog, she said. It's much more than that, said Rosie, her holographic face beaming. It's liberation. Gun Dog was created and written by Gary Witta and performed by Shannon Woodward. Special appearance by Troy Baker. Music by Austin Wintory. Edited by David Gatewood. Sound editing by Adam Nickerson. Video editing by Chandana Ekanayaka. <laughs>